Hey guys, welcome back. This will be your first vodcast for our industrialization unit. Uh, this first section is Chapter 6, Section 1, The Expansion of the Economy. Some of the things that we'll be working on in this section are learning about how our natural resources helped our industries grow, and then inventions during this time period, how those invent inventions impacted everyday lives. Here you see a picture of young men, boys really, working in a textile mill. Their job was to um, remove these spools of thread as soon as they were uh, filled up and notice that they are working in shorts, no shoes, uh, sleeves rolled up. Um, very dangerous situation. These, these rods here are constantly spinning. That's what spools the thread onto the, to the, the spool itself. And um, any long, extra long pieces of clothing or if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, your clothes could get wrapped up around these spools. And the machine doesn't stop until it gets jammed up. There's no automatic shut off. So a very dangerous work for the young guys. And again, these are probably, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. These are some of the things that we're going to encounter when we start, start talking about industry and, and education and the lives of people. Three things helped our industries grow. Extensive natural resources such as lumber, coal, iron ore. Um, the government support for business. Governments were giving out loans to businesses. Um, to get started, but there was also a way that government was supporting business by not getting involved. We've talked about laissez-faire before uh, this time period. Um, throughout the, uh, the period that we've been studying after the Civil War to 1900, um, laissez-faire just means the government stays out and doesn't regulate. That Their lack of regulation was actually supporting them, uh, supporting the factory owners to be able to use whatever means necessary to, to get rich and make a profit. And then our growing urban population the, uh, the city's population was growing uh, by leaps and bounds, people leaving the farms, moving to the cities to take advantage of work in the factories. And um, all of these things lead to a growing industrial nation. One major discovery of this time period was oil. Uh, Native Americans had encountered it out on the plains for a long period of time and they, they usually steered clear of it. They didn't have a big use for it, maybe some medicinal purposes. Um, the first settlers to come across the plain Planes really, again, didn't have a use for it. They might have used it to grease the axles on their wagon wheels, but uh, you know, just any knowledge of it just didn't exist, and it wasn't until experimentation and, the, again, the growth of industries took place that uh, we start really finding a way to use um, crude oil. Um, there is a refining process that oil goes through, and through this refining process, which I'll show you in class, through this refining process, uh, you get several fuels, one of which is kerosene. So we move from candlelight to kerosene uh, lamps, kerosene light. Um, some of you may even use kerosene as a heating source. I know my grandparents did growing up. Um, it has a very distinct smell when it burns, but that's part of uh, the refining process of oil. Edwin Drake is the first person to successfully drill for oil using a steam engine. Uh, he's not the first person to use a steam engine. He's not the first person to drill for oil first person to drill successfully drill for oil using a steam engine and uh, did a pretty good job drilled in Tennessee uh, when he hit him when he hit his first well uh, the oil was bubbling all over the place and they were they were finding any any kind of container to put the put the oil in this steam engine makes drilling uh, a lot cheaper more efficient and again through the refining process we have uh, another fuel called gasoline now early on Gasoline was a byproduct of the refining process, and because there was no internal combustion engines, uh, gasoline was thrown away as a wasted part of the uh, of the refining process. Earlier in the objectives, we talked about, or I mentioned, natural resources. Oil, coal, and iron were the three top natural resources, but also lumber. But these are the top three: oil, coal, and iron, uh, that were very, uh, very much in abundance in America. Uh, huge deposits up in um, Minnesota of iron ore. Um, in class, again, I'll show you the refining process of iron ore, the, what, what, what is known as the Bessemer process, how we take iron ore, melt it down into molten iron, and then from that process, the development of steel occurs, and that's known as the Bessemer process. Coal um, is the common um, resource among these three because you need coal and the heat that you can produce from burning coal to uh, melt your iron to refine your oil. 
and so coal production, coal mining increases dramatically. You can see 30, for 33 million tons um, in 1887 to 250 million tons by 1900. That's how money, that's how, how greatly this industry increased. This map gives you a pretty good idea of where the coal reserves are here in the United States. Over here on your right you have the different types of, uh, of coal and then you can see where they are found in the United States. Up in the northeast corner of our state we have the medium and high volatile bituminous coal. That is the most common type of coal used in American households. Um, when I was growing up we would throw a couple of lumps of coal on the fire at night before we went to bed and that burnt throughout the night. Very, uh, very consistent, very uh, hot heat. If you got too much coal you could actually overheat your stove. But um, very consistent, very dirty. Uh, today uh, we have electrical uh, power plants that uh, generate electricity based on coal po uh, power. They're called coal-powered electrical plants and that's how the electricity is generated. Um, and I think they also use this type of coal. Um, higher burning coal, higher uh, coal that burns at a higher rate and a higher temperature. Um, anthracite and semi-anthracite, you can see the pockets of these of this type of coal is very very small. And then out here in the Appalachians we have obviously a lot of coal uh, found out there. Uh, a moment ago I just mentioned the Bessemer process. Here we see a picture of Henry Bessemer and uh, an, an artist drawing of the of the steel factory. Inside these large cauldrons would be molten iron once it reaches temperature and, and it's ready to be um, poured into molds these large cauldrons would be dumped and uh, into whatever mold the, the case would be. Iron was used for many purposes, mainly railroad tracks. The process is known as Henry Bessemer. Actually, Henry, Henry Bessemer and William Kelly were working on this process together in the United States. The, a situation happened, I don't, I'm not sure the exact situation, but something caused the two men to split up. Bessemer goes back to, to England to continue working on the process. William Kelly stays in America, continues working on the process. The process I'm referring to is trying to create a stronger iron. The problem with iron is that it's very soft and brittle. It tends to break. It's easily corroded by the elements. Um, when you're laying track through the mountains, obviously you're going to have uneven surfaces. And then you take a three, four, five ton uh, railroad car and you run it over that surface um, and the iron rails were breaking. So they needed to find a more efficient metal to use for rail lines and uh, so Henry Bessemer and William Kelly are working on this and they and Bessemer finally figures out that if you burn off the impurities of molten iron mainly carbon you will produce a more stronger um, and lighter metal and uh, of which he called steel it's called the Bessemer process because he figured it out before William Kelly did had William Kelly discovered it first or figured out the process we'd be calling it the Kelly process but um, the Bessemer process allows for us to have a more efficient metal, again, called steel. And the way the process works is that in the liquid state of molten iron, you inject uh, pure oxygen into the, into the molten iron, and uh, it burns off those impurities, again, mainly carbon. Um, Andrew Carnegie is known for his steel plant, and, and uh, Carnegie invests heavily into the Bessemer steel process. New uses for steel. Now that this uh, invention has improved this metal, new uses are uh, railroads, obviously. You can see here a few men driving some stakes into the new rail lines. Again, steel is less corrosive, it's more flexible, it's lighter, it costs less to produce, um, so it's extremely efficient. Um, down here we see a picture of barbed wire. Barbed wire are just tiny threads of steel. Um, then also we have the steel plow, makes sense and the McCormick Reaper, all made from steel. Um, another use of steel, I think may come up later here in a moment, but is uh, suspension bridges, mainly the New York-Brooklyn uh, Bridge, and then a more famous suspension bridge out in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. And there it is, the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, we just finished the unit on the Gilded Age, talking about Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall, and how construction in New York City had to go through Tammany Hall, the political machine, Boss Tweed, again, uh, not, not only did he uh, get the contract for building the United States or the federal courthouse in New York City, 
Uh, he also had the contract, he was in control of the contract for the building of the Brooklyn Bridge and like the courthouse building where he stole millions from the city taxpayers of New York City. Uh, the same thing happened with the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge becomes the largest man-made structure um, except the pyramids at the time. Steel also allows us to build skyscrapers. Um, for example, the largest building for a long time was the insurance building in Chicago. And, um, and then I think after that it became the Sears building and then I believe the Empire State Building and now it's some building, some uh, tower, some hotel in uh, I think it's Denali, India. I'm not sure if that's correct, but I'm, I know it's in the, over in the Middle East or in India somewhere, the, the world's tallest building. I think it has a roller coaster on top or inside or something stupid, it's huge. But um, again, because of its flexibility and its lightweight, it allows architects to really experiment and increase the size of buildings. So one of the big discoveries of the, is the discovery of oil and then the invention and the discovery of the refining process of oil giving us different types of fuel. The discovery of the Bessemer process, uh, I don't want to say the invention of steel because steel was always in there, it was always inside the molten iron. We just had to discover how to bring it out and we do that by burning off the, the impurities, the carbon in, in iron ore. And then uh, now we get into some inventions and Thomas Edison is probably the world's famous, most famous inventor, and he was working at this time period. Um, actually, he had a laboratory, a research laboratory. Um, it's in New Jersey, Menlo Park, New Jersey. And through that invention laboratory, he's given credit for uh, discovering or inventing or coming up with a thousand different inventions, a thousand different patents that have his name tied to it. Now, Edison did not invent a thousand different things. Um, he's most known for the light bulb, the radio, the phonograph, but um, his name is tied to it because these inventions occurred in his plant. Uh, Roosevelt would go out and search out the, the smartest, the brightest, the most uh, innovative men around the world and have, him, have them come work in his plant for him. Well, these men were working in the factories and they would like to work well into the night. You know, if you're on an idea, you don't want to stop because you can't see. You don't, you don't want to stop because it's too dark, so they were working by candlelight. Well, that proved to be extremely inefficient. So as the old saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, Edison had to come up with a way for the, uh, the inventors to work longer into the night. So he started coming up with an idea for a manufactured light. And this is what we have today. The, the part that gave him the most trouble was this filament. He tried several different uh, ways in which to get this filament to burn um, as electricity coursed through it. Human hair, horse hair, proved to be too fine, too brittle. It burned up too easily. Um, I think I think the famous quote is that he found two th two thousand ways how not to make a light bulb work. He just needed one. He finally finds this uh, element called tungsten, in which he creates a monofilament out of it. Mono meaning one, a one strand tungsten filament. Electricity comes through, and uh, it heats up the tungsten. The tungsten glows. This vacuum-packed bulb allows the, the light to be brighter. And uh, away they went, working into the night. Um, also from this factory, we see the invention of the power grid, or basically what we call today power factories or electric factories, where electricity can be channeled and distributed through two homes and buildings. This allows for factories to be now built away from sources of water. Our early factories were built right next to rivers uh, because that was their power source. And now with the power grid system, the ability to move electricity from a power plant to a home or to a building, um, cities can grow and they don't have to be near water sources. With this um, growth of electricity, we also see uh, time-saving devices developing. As cities grow, the need for travel around the cities increases. And so we see the first electric streetcars for urban travel. Again, urban meaning the city. Um, yeah, just the, the growth of cities, the, the amount of factories being built in cities because of this power grid system is immense. As I said just a second ago, these power grids allows factories to be built away from sources of river. Uh, then we get into the meatpacking industry. With the growth of cities, the people living in the cities need food and the cattle industry takes off around the 1870s. 
big cattle drives through the Midwest, um, load, the, load the cattle up on railroads, ship them back east to slaughterhouses in Chicago, and then that meat is packed and sent to the big cities on the East Coast. Two big feet meat companies at the time, Armor Meat Packing and Swift Meat Packing. And these factories become new models for this type of industry. And a few other inventions that take place in this time. Inventions that change lifestyle. We have the typewriter by Christopher Schultz. We have the telephone by Alexander Graham Bell. Interesting fact about uh, Alexander Graham Bell. His hobby was working on the telephone. His hobby was uh, to be an inventor. He actually worked in the U.S. Patent Office, which issues the rights to an inventor, the rights to that invention for that inventor. Um, he had a telephone that he was working on that he couldn't figure out how to get it to work. And one day, came across his desk a patent for a working telephone. He studied the patent, figured out why his phone was not working. Um, when you apply for a patent, you have to have the money attached to the application. Well, the patent that he was looking at was from a poor immigrant who didn't have the money at the time. So that patent got stuck on the bottom of a pile. And um, Alexander Graham Bell goes home, makes the adjustments to his phone, files for the patent, and the rest is history. He becomes known as the first man to make a working telephone. But it's all because of the patent that he was able to view through his job. All of these things impact the workplace and you, if you understand what I'm saying here, um, these two items allow for women to enter the workplace because these two items become known as secretaries uh, tools, typing, typing letters and answering phones. For the longest time that was considered a woman's job. Today it's not so much. You see a lot of men who are secretaries or administrative assistants, if you want to be politically correct. But early, early on, the typewriter and telephone allow women to enter the workforce in what we would call a white-collar job, where they're not uh, getting down and dirty with the machines, but uh, just sitting at a desk answering phones, typing letters. Also, these make uh, make your jobs a lot easier. It's less, less back-breaking, less manual labor, if you will. And that's what we mean by white collar versus blue collar. Blue collar is more manual labor, working with your hands. Now, a lot of these inventions did reduce the worth that owners of factories viewed their workers to have. Um, if they're not having to work as hard, then the worth of those workers goes down, according to the factory owners. And as factories grow, um, we start to see um, competition for jobs increase, people willing to work for cheaper amounts of money and that only increases the profits for the factory owner and as a result of the growing industry we also see a growth in labor unions and then we see from labor unions we see a huge move toward strikes and we'll get into that uh, later on in the next section. Alright, thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye.